Alright guys, I know, I am still capable, believe it or not, of making videos that aren't just on AFCs. Uh, but this is going to be the last one. We will get back to other stuff quite soon. I've talked about this a few times. Yesterday I did an AFC uh, or a video recapping an AFC talking about Guild Wars 1. Well, as well as the Reddit Ask Me Anything, we also had a forum AFC on the most recent release, Long Live the Lich. And there's still little aspects of Long Live the Lich I haven't had a chance to talk to you about. So we're going to cover this now. It's marked as the June AFC, as you can see here. Uh, technically, I think this actually happened in July, and they were hoping to do another one. Uh, but whatever you consider this, it wasn't a particularly big AFC at all. Maybe it's because people had their fill of asking the devs things on Reddit. Maybe it's because Long Live the Lich didn't have too much that inspired people to talk about. Maybe it's a sign of the trend of the general population. I'm not entirely sure. But there were a few responses. Notably as well, just as when I covered the Long Live the Lich AMA, this was before the tweet storm stuff with Jessica and Peter, and they will get into it a little bit here. In fact, there's a big piece of misinformation out there about that day on Twitter that I can resolve for you all now here on this video. So, yeah, let's get in, uh, and it gives me an opportunity to talk about some of these other topics. Uh, so, what do they open with? First, we have Gail saying, Hello, we invite you to join several Guild Wars 2 Living World devs and members of other teams too for the June 2018 Arena Net Forum chat, the AFC. We're experimenting with our time spans, and this time we'll welcome your questions, comments, and feedback about episode 3 from Friday afternoon through Monday. The devs will answer any time they can. So you guys can pause the video if you want to see some of the more details there. She also says that the times for this AFC were altered a few times because they wanted to get things settled with the game and ensure that the AFC follows the Reddit, allowing more in-depth questions and follow-ups. Uh, that idea that AFCs should be providing more in-depth insights, I'm not sure what we're, get, we're really getting. I know that the devs, in theory, should have more time to answer the questions on these, but I don't think they're going back en masse as much as maybe the original concept was. And quite often, the answers we're getting here are about just on par as meaty as what was happening on Reddit anyway. Moving to the start, the first question that got a response is actually a little bit boring and something that was talked about on the AMA, but I'll go over it here. Uh, the OP asked many questions. This is the only one we're really interested in. Law question in Be My Guest instance. We get to have a nice conversation with one of the awakened canids, and during this, it's easy to see that the bottom jaw of the mask actually moves, suggesting there's a canid head in there. And there's a lot of these guys in Joker's forces, maybe too many for him to be making them from the other parts. Is there currently a canid race out there that Joko is taking these guys from? I know all the giant ones are gone, but are there still more human-sized ones? Did we possibly just save slash anger a race we don't even know? It's a cool idea. Uh, Peter Freeze came in with a response and said the canids and abominations in Joko's awakened army were fashioned from necrotic flesh into a form that he found useful for his purposes, which is a very slight twist on what we'd already heard, but pretty much straight up c confirming that that's not some extra race that we haven't seen in the flesh yet. We've only seen them in an awakened form. He's just manipulating corpses and to quite a wide extent across a huge number of his army. So something much more interesting here, we have Jessica Price responding to some questions uh, and quite a few in sequence. So first, she gets this. To what extent are the central Tyrian people slash nations involved in the war on Palawa Joko? Is the pact outreach mission the only response? And what was it meant to achieve? Or is this really just a domestic civil war the commander has accidentally unleashed on the way? It's a good question as well, remembering that early in this season, there was a lot of stuff about getting core Tyria involved, the awakened invasions that started appearing, and just kind of that sense that they were trying to up the ante and make the core Tyrians really invested in this conflict. And uh, now that we've seen how that kind of all comes to a head with this release, Long Live the Lich, I don't know how much that really paid off. And I'll take this moment as well just to say, sorry, I should have said at the head of the video, there'll be a lot of big spoilers in this video. I'm assuming you played the story in this video because there is pretty explicit detail about everything that happens here. Everything. So, yeah, be aware of that. 
If you haven't seen it yet, I have done hours and hours and hours of content over on Wooded Potatoes 2 about the story, including full dedicated playthroughs you can go see uh, for yourselves already. Anyway, so yes, Jessica's response to this about Call of Tyria is, The Pact sent supplies as a gesture of goodwill, but Tyria has largely been able to handle the awakened incursions, especially since the gates into Tyria got shut down. So, Joko declaring war on Tyria was received in Tyria largely with a, Okay, my dude, good luck with that. But even for him, this isn't about Tyria, it's about the commander. That was largely grandstanding. Had he been able to actually deploy the Scarab Plague in the way he wanted, it would have been serious. But the commander, in this patch, shut that down. Uh, so that's their explanation there. It feels a bit tacky. It's basically like at the head of the season, they're like, Oh yeah, this is serious for all of Tyria. Oh no, don't worry, not really. Uh, anyway, the next question she got was, is there a reason the Order of Shadows were not present as Keystone allies in such an important event? Talking about the uh, events of this patch and the big assault on Joko, of course. I seem to recall that removing Palawa Joko was one of their main goals, which makes it very strange indeed that they would be, or appear to be, entirely absent for a direct attack on a citadel. Jessica's response here is that they're more spies than fighters. I do think there's more to this, though, than she's saying, because if you watch closely... It doesn't seem to be particularly true that their entire objective is removing Palawa Joko. We get evidence directly to the contrary of that with the law book from the Desolation back at Path of Fire's release. Go back, listen to that, guys. It talks about how the Order of Whispers from Quarteria infiltrate the Order of Shadows and discover that the Order of Shadows are propagating some pretty horrible stuff to maintain the status quo, that having the nation in this struggle against Palawa is benefiting them somehow. And if anything, they kind of wanted to rise up through the chaos of that Littlefinger style. So yeah, I think that more will be revealed about those in the later parts of this season now, and they might even get a bit of a spotlight. There was even a curious moment in episode one where we seemed like we were going to be getting some assistance and we didn't in the end. Uh, but all Jessica's content to say for now is that they're more spies than fighters. Uh, and then the next question here as well is what is motivating the Corsairs to be part of this war? From what I can recall, Seda the Sly was an extremely mercenary character who seems to have become a surprisingly reliable ally with the strong fleet to boot out of the blue. Is she being paid for her contribution or are there other considerations which have mellowed her pirate heart? And Jessica has a cool response to this. She says, complete chaos is bad for business and she's making a bet that you're going to win. And whoever takes over governing a loner is going to be someone who was on your side. So her help is the nature of an investment. It's a really weird thought. If you guys go back again to when Path of Fire came out, when you first enter Vabi, uh, you are talked to about how complicated it would be just to go and slaughter through this area of the world and remove all the Awakened and remove Joko and just think that that's happiness and that that's solved. The truth is that this is... Uh, a nation that in many ways loves Joker and come to love their dictator and co come to love their impoverished state and the idea that we come in, create all this chaos and then instill pirates as the new rulers or, you know, at least in the wings of the new rulers is kind of amazing. There's so much deep stuff that the, uh, this season could continue going into. I don't think the story of Elona is necessarily over just because of the events of episode three. So yeah, uh, Jessica even has another quick little comment in the same thread here, I think it was. Someone said, wasn't there something in episode 2 about gaining renown on the tail of the commander's exploits too? And uh, Jessica says, yep, helping you is good PR for her. And the Corsairs, of course. So there you have it. Uh, moving on to another thread. Uh, we have quite a lot of interesting conversation. And it comes off of the back of a guild chat. So it's very likely... You guys aren't watching the guild chats anymore, but they are still pretty interesting and especially after a living world release comes out You do get a lot of behind-the-scenes information about things that might have been and then in, in the end weren't for this release The guild chat talked a lot about well not a lot But it broached some of the story threads that potentially could have been something and then weren't and this AFC came very quickly Hot off the heels of that so check it out. Uh, the first question is why was the awakened assassin idea removed? This is one of the potential from the guild chat. We're already aware that the general reason was that it was too dark for the narrative, but is there a more specific reasoning or rationale that you can provide? Because it seems like such a snazzy concept to be removed for that simple of a reason. Uh, and so Jessica's response on this is that they removed it, they didn't go with this story idea, 
not primarily because it was a tone thing. It was just that as we worked the story arc, it ended up being this thing we kept around because it was a cool idea. And eventually we had to be honest with ourselves and admit it didn't fit anymore and it would have been shoehorned in. Another question along the same lines is about Farron. What was the tragic event that would have sparked Farron's rise to heroism? We were told that Farron was originally meant to experience something extremely harrowing that would push him to take up arms for a more personal and dynamic reason, but that it was cut because, again, it was too dark for the narrative. Is there a specific reason as to why this was cut as well? So, obviously, Farron has appeared in this patch again, and he's very heroic, and he's very serious in this patch, and they cut, like, uh, an actual underlying motivational reason that was a bit deeper uh, for why this happened. Farron gives uh, it's Farron. Jessica gives a pretty detailed response to this one. She says, What we really wanted to do with Farron was. Okay, so he's been largely comic relief, and we wanted to give him this arc that to me felt very real because I've seen it happen in real life where somebody you've kind of written off as being useless or shallow or whatever suffers some kind of tragedy and wants to stay involved with something but is clearly emotionally bleeding all over the place and out of pity you give them some busy work so they can feel useful. You're not expecting anything out of it and then you check in on them and they've knocked it out of the park. And they haven't become any someone else or anything. That was always there. You just didn't see it before. Or maybe even they didn't see it before. So we had this idea that Farron was going to have gotten engaged. And we had this whole backstory for him and his fiancée. But there was a lot of discomfort with the idea that we were fridging this woman. We'd created her just to die. Like, she wasn't even really going to have any screen time before she died. So that didn't feel right. So then we were like, okay, maybe it's Marula. She's got a backstory in pre-existence. Uh, a side note here, if you guys don't remember Marula, she was in Living World Season 2, and I think maybe even a little bit... Was she... She must have been one of the uh, nobles in the jungle in Heart of Thorns, right? That essentially was crushing on Farron, right? So we knew about this and the idea that they could have said, oh, she's the fiancé. Uh, but Jessica goes on and says, it's a hard balance because we want characters to have lives off screen, but we don't want to cheat the audience of the interesting stuff going on with them. But that didn't feel right either once we'd played it out. It hadn't been earned for one thing, and for another, it still felt like a disservice to Marula. And ultimately, we were spending all this time and brain space on this sea story because we like Farron, but not because it was serving the main storyline. It was time and brain brand bandwidth we didn't actually have to spare. This episode went through a lot of revision, and we had to devote it to getting the A and B stories right. So, since we couldn't do the work we need to do to set it up properly, we cut the aspect where his rise to heroism is inspired by losing someone he loves. I I've said it time and time again, what happened very shortly after this AFC aside, she had some fantastic responses, and it really did feel like the narrative was in pretty good hands because she's considered very carefully, the team has considered very carefully, many of the things that you'd want them to, and it's being expressed directly to the player base in posts like this. I will miss these posts, I really will. And she gets another question here as well. What are the limitations for darkness slash mature themes in the Guild Wars 2 narrative? It seems to be a bit inconsistent at times, where we have storylines like Bastion of the Penitent, which are quite disturbing, and we have the comparison of Long Live the Lich, which aside from the final cutscene, was quite family friendly and had no overt consequences. Uh, when you'd expect to have quite a dark, mature tone for a primarily Joko-based storyline. I Let me just say, I will disagree with the questioner here. They're right that the tone of Guild Wars 2 is all over the place. The tone of the franchise is all over the place, frankly, and they're very correct to point out Bastion or the Penitent's tone in contrast to other things. But Long Live the Lich was generally decidedly dark. I mean, most of the things that made Bastion of the Penitent dark, like the torture chamber and the pyramids and stuff, that was there before the final cutscene. Uh, so I don't know whether it's fair to say they had no overt consequences throughout that patch. But anyway, Jessica's response, which I'm sure is what you're all much more interested in hearing, is that she says, well, for example, our ESRB rating is one of the reasons that when a certain character gets eaten, that has to be conveyed through audio rather than through visuals. Showing dismemberment is something we can't do. If we want anything that's too dark, it has to be largely something that's conceptual and implied rather than explicitly shown or talked about. This is an interesting topic for me. I used to think about a lot way back when. 
Guild Wars 2 was in its early days and I was struggling to reconcile and understand why the tone had shifted so much in so many ways. Uh, and I did wonder how much ESRB factored into that. Uh, we could talk a lot about it, actually. The game has depicted several things being eaten before. A specific event right at the start of Blood Tide Coast where a fa uh, Fisher, I think it is, gets eaten by a drake comes to mind. The Triple Trouble Worm has a worm eating in Ty Zergs. It's like very specific what cannot be shown. She narrows it down straight there to dismemberment. But I'm sure we can find some headless characters and things in various places. Uh, one thing I always think about as well, back in Guild Wars 1, some of those descriptions of infanticide and stuff on the bleached bones in the Crystal Desert were really striking and shocking. But they got away with it because it's purely in text. And then there's the question, can Guild Wars 2 bring the tone to that level? Should it? Uh, I suppose topics for a video on the tone. So there you go, that's a little bit from Jessica. Continuing the same conversation on, we move to Peter Freeze now. Uh, the community responds to Jessica talking about how they didn't want to just quickly kill this fiance off. And Hart Haley Dawn says this, This is interesting because during Living World Season 2, Marjorie's sister Belinda was indeed written in and only created to die in Fort Salma. Was Farron's, fi Farron's fiance plot decision reworked because of this? Or just because all of a sudden it doesn't feel right using cheap plot twists. I hope this doesn't read a standoffish point of view. I was genuinely curious as to writing change. It does sound really standoffish. And Pete uh, has a nice response. He says, it isn't all of a sudden. Entanglement from Living World Season 2 was four years ago. But we're always trying to raise the bar for ourselves on storytelling. I mean, yeah, there's no way that that would have been all of a sudden. However, I think that the... Um, community member does have an interesting point in that it does seem like a high chance they would look at what happened with Belinda. That was really not enjoyed by the community and maybe uh, maybe experiences like that have warned them away, you know? Still discussing Farron, uh, I think one last message on this thread was from Denari who says, I'm interested in all things Farron. This disclosure, however, suggests a debunking of my pet theory that he is E, a la the Scarlet Pimpernel. If he's been comic relief that needed some sort of goad to rise to heroism, then he hasn't been the secret information broker all along, so I'm sad. Uh, not that he can still be written that way, and this is all a clever double blind, but I can be objective enough about my theory to acknowledge as a desperate reaching on my part rather than some sane speculation. Peter says, at one point we filled a marker board with names of characters in consideration to kill in the previous three episodes, and I spent a lot of time cruelly tormenting Dara by claiming Farron was going to meet a terrible uh, fate, and if you saw some of the older streams, you'll know she was a big fan. I don't know whether I agree with this. This developer discussion here on the AFC does doesn't debunk the Farron is E thing. Farron could have been E the whole time while the devs are now in season four sitting down figuring out how to make him more serious. You have to think about this. I think that this episode, Long Live the Lich, more than any other patch, has emboldened those theories because Farron has always just been comic relief, really. He flirted a bit with being a serious character right at the start if you were a human noble. But generally speaking, he's always been comic relief. And now they've decided to remind us that he can be a serious character. Now they've done that. Why would they do that unless perhaps it's in service of making us realize he was serious all along and he was E all along? I still think it works, and I don't even think this is necessarily a double blind. Maybe Denari's interpretation is more in line with you guys's, but yeah, it's still on the table for me. Oh, so looking at this next uh, message from Jessica, it seems it is the same thread. Uh, Jessica responds to that. And says, I can't really speak to Living World Season 2 uh, decisions. That was long before my time. What I can say is that whether or not a trick or a trope is cheap or not is largely about the context, how it's used, rather than the thing itself. It's like an apogitura sounds sappy and cheap as hell in some places and is achingly beautiful in others. Getting a bit into music theory here, but she says, I can't say we won't ever introduce a character that quickly gets killed off. But I can say that in this case, it was something that we didn't feel was something that treated the character with justice and dignity and compassion, which is something we try to do as writers, even if the story or other characters don't. So we decided not to do it. I think she's bang on there about tropes as well. One of the most frustrating things for me to butt my head against is when someone uh, bluntly dismisses something by saying, oh, it's cliche or it's a trope. You know, these things are tools and things are cliche for a reason. It's definitely about how they're packaged and couched rather than, as she says, the thing itself. And lastly, she compliments some of her co-workers here by saying we have some extraordinarily talented people around uh, to finish off the thread. 
Moving over to another thread here. Uh, yeah, sorry again, you'll notice a lot of the ones that got responses here were law oriented ones. And I think we can basically owe that nearly entirely just down to Peter Freeze and Jessica for engaging with the community on these matters. There are a couple of messages in other arenas. And obviously this was a Living World release that was really very much about the story. But uh, mostly this is it. So we get Beast Marsha Aluwa Iranko as the subject header. Uh, and Alamar saying, I must say, I've loved Iranko's character. I really hope she comes back at a later date, even though Joko wasn't going to let her come back. Personally, I'd like to request that we add her to the Commander's Squad Slash Guild now that most of the Awakened are free from Joko's control and most of the Awakened have a sense of self outside of Thralls, I think. I feel this character needs the justice she deserves. But anyway, I feel it would actually be an excellent decision to add an Awakened character characters to the commander's group or have them like Aranko be more recurring characters in the upcoming episodes and expansions any plans comments or thoughts on these suggestions Peter simply says Aranko has likely gone to her reward finally free of her servitude to Joko who can say what adventurers we may have with other awakened characters though <sighs> Now, this sounds like a huge hint because obviously we're all thinking of Koss. And indeed, if you look at the community response just down here, so I'll take that as a rock solid confirmation that we're adding Koss to the roster of Dragon's Watch. Say no more. So, yes, we saw Koss in episode one. Koss, despite the fact we were back at the Dejaran estate in this episode, was not involved in this release. But with Joko out of the picture, yeah, these are the big spoilers I was talking about, we do now have quite a wide array of different NPCs out there. I suppose even Talkoru is a curious one to think about. What is their fate? Do they just dissolve into death at last now? Or will they continue to amble about and do their thing? Is it these characters we should really look to to rise into that power vacuum now within the nation of Elona? It's kind of fascinating to think that Koss could be back for even more. He was much loved around episode one, but I wonder whether he works as much more than a cameo appearance. It's going to be extremely strange having a really strong Guild Wars 1 character also take center stage in Guild Wars 2. You'll notice they've been very careful not to do that throughout the franchise. Ogden, though he's had appearances, is not center stage. Livia, though having appearances, is not center stage. MOX, I guess. But if we come to, to cost joining Dragon's Watch, wow, what a, what a response that would be. So, uh, let's move on. As I mentioned, much of it is lore. Here's one of the main places where we get some juicy mechanics stuff. And those who have lived vicariously through this patch, using my videos but not really played it much, might not know the topic here. It's about the FTT turrets. So, this is a new system on the map whereby there's a collection... Uh, and as you complete it, you unlock turrets you can buy for some of the new currencies and you can drop them down. They do various things in combat. There should be some footage of them in the background of this AFC video eventually. Uh, you can create giant walls, you can create AoE damage, single target damage. It's an interesting system. Uh, and one of the players was curious about it. So Keevan Freeman, I think that's how we say his name. Uh, decided to jump in and respond. He says, since I developed and implemented the field tech turret system, I'll do my best to answer these. Uh, first of all, can we get an AI update to the attack turrets? Currently, they seem to attack weird things like walls or objects in walls, and it would be nice to see them prioritize my target for area of effect and direct damage. Uh, they say that the offensive turrets are currently set to select a random enemy within range each time it fires. I decided to go this route because I wanted the turrets to feel low maintenance. I.e. you just set it up to start blasting without having to worry about target juggling for the sake of the turret. I say that as a way of explanation of where my head was when I made that, not as a veiled way of suggesting it's off limits. I'm not averse to tweaking this. I'll talk with the team about it. Thumbs up. It'll be interesting if they do. They're very rare to go back and tweak stuff like this within Living World really. Another question about them. Secondly, I suppose there's a max target cap on the support turrets. The boon wall, the shield, the speed, the healing. If so, what is that cap? Uh, and Keevan says, the support turrets currently have a max target of five per pulse with your party and your squad taking priority. I'm a bit, since it's such an open worldy feeling thing, I'm a bit disappointed that you said to five. Ten might have been nice, but yep. Third, the turrets feel really awkward, and I'm wondering if there's a design reason for this. Are they inheriting player stats for damage healing boon duration, or is this fixed, and their impact is supposed to be low? Because that feels unrewarding to use, invest time into. I'll note on the other side of the coin here that the community doesn't, that if you make them too potent, you kind of lock 
players into feeling like they need to have them all the time and then you introduce all kinds of upsetting grind issues and time spent issues. That's always a consideration with consumables and stuff. So, uh, Kevin says, the turret does not inherit anything from you when you deploy it. It has its own stats. Outgoing damage per bolt for the direct damage turret doesn't change as you upgrade it, but that's because there are other things that increase as you upgrade it. The number of bolts, the number of chained bolts, and overload chance percent per initial bolt all increase as you upgrade. Thus, the average DPS for the turret increases despite the damage per bolt remaining static. The other turrets have statistics which are less complex. Most of the other functions have va set values that increase at a controlled and easily configurable rate through their upgrade cycles. We tried to make sure the numbers were balanced so the turrets would be attractive and fun but not feel like you had to have them in order to be effective on the map. That was the goal at any rate. Like I parenthetically noted above, all the numbers for the turrets are easily configurable. I did that specifically so that they could be revisited and tweaked should the need arise. I guess I'm just cynical as to when they'll consider the need being arising. I think it's more likely they'll just move to another living world map. Eventually people will zerg away from corner and that'll be it, right? Uh, I mean, this is very much a side underlying system to the patch. You can do all the story, all the events and everything without interacting with the turrets at all. They are that little needed, let alone like signaled to. Uh, and so finally, another question on the turrets. I'd like to ask this, that any plans to maybe update the user interface to allow players to directly deploy higher level turrets, perhaps on the bundle itself, slots two to four? This is something I kept going back and forth on. Ultimately, the reason I went for the incremental method was twofold. So just so you guys know, you have to place the turret and then interact with it to continue upgrading it. It says, first, the upgrade achievements don't care whose turret you upgrade. You can all earn the upgrade unlocks by helping your friend upgrade their turrets. If you had the ability to deploy a max level turret, we remove a few rungs from the community ladder we tried to build into the system. That said, I'm not blind to the in the heat bat of battle frustration of having to deploy the turret site, configure the turret, upgrade the turret, upgrade again, upgrade again, or in some repeat cycle. I would like to maintain the former while helping reduce the latter, so I welcome more discussion on this. And lastly, second and somewhat selfishly, that interface is already a confusing mess under the hood, and the thought of adding more things to it kind of scares me. <laughs> Uh, isn't that always the story when you really get down to it with issues within games? I'm pretty sure so there you go a little bit more on the turrets and maybe I'll put some effort into Paying more attention showing them off on some upcoming streams or something where we can dive into the weirder little aspects of the game And uh, see what we think there. All right moving on another question This one's about destiny's edge more story oriented topics very simple question simple answer Anthony GW says so we're constantly being told what pack commander Thackeray is doing behind the scenes but what happened to the rest of the gang? Kaith was one of my favorite characters and her contribution to the plot is always great. Will we ever get to see those characters again? Obviously excluding Ritlock. Peter says, stay tuned, we haven't forgotten about them. Uh, so let's do a recap here. Kaith actually had quite a reasonable impact, I think, last season. But obviously, Path of Fire had a very narrow cast of characters, so several of them feel like they've been away for a long time now. Even hell, a lot of Dragon's Watch members, I feel like, haven't had enough screen time, even most recently, like Marjorie. Uh, so, yes, you've got uh, Kaith, but even she's more prominent. When we do look at the big one, which is Zodja, a lot of our heads will be scratching. That's what the community asks here. Haley Dawn says Zodja in the next episode then. And Peter says Zodja was in the earlier drafts of episode two. We haven't forgotten about her either. And so yeah, we did. I think the guild chat talked about this as well. That Zodja was a big consideration. And we might have already seen her in this season. But they moved away from it. Uh, Tanner Blackfeather asks this. Says what caused her not to be included. And Peter says. Realizing that we would have had two episodes in a row. With a female Asuran genius being captured and threatened by the bad guy. So if you remember the end of episode one of this season had Taimi being captured, taken away in the city of Farina, and they were going to do a very similar thing for Zodja immediately on the next episode of the Sand Reptiles, so they moved away from it. Look, they just, it, the, the thing is they got a lot of Asuran characters. That's the, that's the fact of the matter, and I don't know whether the overlap would have felt really tacky, but yeah, we miss out on Zodja for that. And uh, I'm sure she'll be somewhere. Do remember there were some vaguely cryptic tweets from Felicia Day not too long ago that she had done some VA for them. I wonder if that will end up on the cutting room floor then, or it's still something yet for us to see. We did get a tiny bit more detail from Zodja as well last season. Uh, when we were in Rata Nova, so I believe we could eavesdrop on some Asura and they talked a little bit about Zodja. So we have heard a bit about her since she was in the Blighting Pod at the end of Heart of Thorns, but yeah, not much. 
Next question is about Chirai Osa. This is probably my favorite community question that was asked on this AFC. And again, it was a lot shorter than most AFCs. Uh, Chief Captain Morani says, So this episode had us face Joko. But there was no mention of the person who defeated him the first time. Churai Osa. He showed up in Season 2 and in Stronghold, along with a reference to him in Path of Fire in the Vabi Theatre Quest. But why was he not mentioned at all in this mission as maybe someone to resummon and ask for advice or anything like that? So, the OP doesn't seem to know about one of the cooler aspects of the third Path of Fire map, which I desperately recommend they go check out. But yeah, I, I thought this when I was playing this patch. If you really look at Joko's history in the broader context of this franchise, Chirai is a huge part of it. Not just Chirai, but the Order of Whispers slash Order of Shadows, I guess, are huge aspects of Joko's story that I really wanted to hear Joko talk about or just reference, demonstrate that he still had on his mind in any way. And we didn't get the most remote, slight, sideways glance to either of them. You know, the Order of Whispers slash Shadows are an order that freaking kept him imprisoned for hundreds of years. That was a big, big deal. And of course, Chirai 2, we didn't get any of it. I feel like these are some of the failings of this release. Uh, again, I talked long enough hours about this over on the streams. Peter Free says in response that in an earlier iteration of this episode, Chirai himself was going to show up in ghost form to gloat over Joko's defeat. It didn't fit the final cinematic version of that moment, but hopefully the state of the domain of Corner makes it plain that Joko still harbored a grudge over his defeat in Jahai, and that he made a project of persecuting the homeland of the Kornan army that once defeated him. It's not just about Chirai either, it's about that entire like lineage that I find really fascinating and would have wanted a lot more details on. It doesn't help that the domain of corner that we got was not really seated in a particularly interesting area because we didn't get the Grand Karak, we didn't get the Fortress of Jahai, we didn't get his tomb. And I can only hope that that stuff's going to come later on in the series. I guess Peter did try and it's true that corner is definitely the most messed up of all Ilonan provinces or domains. But uh, I, I, I feel very underwhelmed with how they did on this. I love the idea that he'd have properly appeared in the release. If you think about how this patch started, we begin by recruiting ghost allies. And instead of linking that into Churai, they instead linked it into the Tomb of the Primeval Kings and the Twin Queens. Both were great options. I mean, the tw Twin Queens and their loss of their dynasty, the start of the Ca uh, Scarab Plague all the back that time, probably do key in a bit better, and they were golden path from Path of Fire, while Chirai also wasn't. Uh, so I kind of get why they went with that, but a world where they'd done both, you know, you just have a little instance of the uh, Tomb of the Primeval Kings and a little moment going back to the Ellen Riverlands, that could have been really good, and then they just combine the ghost army you get uh, with respect to both of these, or all three of these great heroes. That might have been nice, uh, and they didn't in the end, so a bit of unfortunate, but at least it appeared there on the AFC. Continuing along, getting towards the end of the AFC now, we have Kabaram. So, which writer came up with that delayed payoff Joko Bram gag in Be My Guest? I think that was my favorite part of the episode. So, what I think the OP is talking about is in the final instance, Joko taunts Bram and treats him like a dumb norn for gags and says, Can you even spell epidemic? That's like right near the start of the instance, and we all laugh because ha ha ha, Norn is stupid, and I have my heart ripped in two because I miss what the Norn once upon a time were. And we move on. Then at the end of the instance, after Joko is defeated, Bram comes running in and shouts out loud how to spell epidemic. And that's also funny because it's like he's been mulling on it the entire time and now he's really proud he's got it right. So, uh, yeah, this OP says I think that was my favorite part of the episode. It was very well done. And Peter says, I don't remember the authorship of that line. Neil Polner was the lead writer on the episode, but nearly everyone on the narrative team had some hand in that chapter in particular. Taylor Sutherland, the designer on that instance, also contributed lots of great dialogue ideas. I think Canuck's whistling was Taylor's idea. Next, another member of the community responded by saying, I'm more a fan of the Joko's right commander, you're a terrible person, line myself, but ultimately I'm glad that they've managed to properly redeem Bram as a character again. Uh, and Jessica's a great response, she says, I'm happy that you think he's redeemed. From my perspective, he's moving in that direction, but he's still got a lot of work to do, smiley face. I really love her response here, because what she's doing is calling out the community, talking very dogmatically about stuff, which I tend to do myself as well, and I'm trying to refine out of myself. But we do this on the internet, we say, oh yeah, 
yeah, Bram is just redeemed now. That's a fact. He's redeemed. He's done. But, you know, that's a subjective thing based on people's perspectives. And Jessica clearly calls that out there. And all of us who still don't really like Bram much and are hoping for a stronger redemption story can breathe easy because she's suggesting that there's more coming up. So that's cool. Uh, but then there's even more responses about the original question. Neil Porner was the main story writer for episode three. Armin Constantine and I maintain the overall storyline and tone. And Tom Abernathy as narrative director oversees and approves and does a polish pass on everything. But this episode especially marked the development of our writer's room, which up till this point had been mainly Tom doing live polishes while the writers sat in to watch. Tom really opened it up to become a collaboration rather than a masterclass, and the results were pretty great. There are very few lines in episode 3 that weren't touched by multiple people. Tom's described a lot of the comedy as being like Katamari. One person would throw out a line and everyone would start going around adding to or reworking it. A lot of the comedic impetus came from Samantha Walshinger, if a line stabs you right in the field, she probably has something to do with it. Lily, you had just joined the team at this point and was the one who wrote a lot of great Joko dialogue that set the tone and mood. They were so good at both the humor and the right in the field stuff that they're doing the main story writing for episode four. Peter Freeze and Alex Kane both have amazing comedy chops and were often the ones who floored the gas pedal on humor. Lindsay Murdoch, our primary liaison with design, is one of the primary tastemakers slash insanity checks outside our team since she has an exquisitely calibrated sense for this stuff. We like to have her in the room whenever she can spare time. If we can make her laugh or give her goose bumps or make her tear up, we know we've got good stuff. So the answer is I don't remember who planted the seed for that line, but I can tell you that multiple people watered it. Again, I kind of like this response because it just so shows how collaborative everything is. The bigger insight to me there is, if we look back up, the idea that some guys were working on episode three and did so good they went to episode four, which kind of flies in the face of how we understood some of these teams worked in that multiple episodes were all going in tandem at once. Does that not suggest that episode four production didn't start till way after three? Um, but yeah, so uh, then we get one final message down here from Peter, who says, Neil Paulner asked me from the East Coast to share the following insights about this instance, being my guest. The Cabram line at the end of the epidemic line was ad-libbed in the sound booth by Sam Rigel. Rigel? As far as the E-P-I-D-E-M-I-C line itself, I wrote the Joko setup and the Bram punchline for that. Taylor was the genius who came up to me and said that Bram has to say praise Joko after Aureen eats him. So there you go, lots of little anecdotes and insights about lots of people's names who we probably don't really have an understanding and faces to match them to, but there you go. Neil himself even pops in here uh, and responds to the community saying, I haven't played the chapter twice, but part of me thinks it might have been neat if Bram actually didn't spell epidemic right, like Homer spelling smart, S-M-R-T, uh, while setting fire to his house. I uh, actually considered that, says Neil, but decided it would be a bit too one note. We are actively trying to make our characters more well-rounded and complex. I will say, in my mind, Bram is quietly puzzling out how to spell it during every lull in the Gandara proceedings. You go disarm the traps, Commander. I'll cover you. Now think, Bram. Is it I-C, I-K, or I-C-K? Uh, I think that's amazing. I kind of don't like the headcanon because, again, it makes the Norn look stupid and I don't like this stupid Norn angle, but still, it's funny. And I guess if that's your uh, jam, then you're going to enjoy that. Okay, right towards the end now, and this final thread, once again, is about lore. It's about the final instance again, but this is uh, the big mistake that I and pretty much everyone made when it came to the tweet storm and the Jessica Price firing stuff very shortly after. So, here we go. It's Dapper Shark 4958 who says, Hey, very simple question. Joko mentioned breaking out some crystals in the final instance. What was he referring to? Is it the crystals scattered around the map that award volatile magic when broken, or was he referring to something we have yet to see? Okay, so um, I'm just going to pause for a second and explain this to you guys. I played this co-op, and when I heard the line breaking out the crystal from Joko, I immediately recognized that was just like a colloquialism. That's just a, phrase, a turn of phrase that people sometimes say. The idea is, you know, you're, you're putting out the fine... China, you're having all your nice stuff out for some big dinner meeting or get together. It's something people say in real life. And it just basically means, yeah, I'm, I'm going all out for this social occasion or whatever. So when Joko says to us, oh, let's break out the crystal, he's acting in a wry way like this should be some big celebration. It should be serious because who's got the commander? He's being sarcastic. He's taunting you. That's it. But to understand Joko's line, 
uh, and not take it at face value. You kind of have to know that colloquialism. You have to know the idea of breaking out the crystal. So what the ArenaNet writers did was assumed that that was a common enough phrase no one would get confused. However, like I said, I played this co-op. I immediately understood it. The person I was playing with, though, said, what crystal to me? And I was like, wait, what, what do you mean, what crystal? And I realized, oh, if you aren't familiar with this phrase, you might take it at face value. And we actually had a conversation very briefly as we played, because so much is going on in that instance. It only occupies a moment of your time. Uh, we actually wondered, you know, is that, is that good writing? It Was this a little bit too of an obscure term that might have brought some unnecessary confusion to things. And then, well, here you see on the AFC very quickly later, here's an innocent enough person, Dapper Shark, who made that mistake and seems to think there's a real crystal that Joko was hoarding. And you could easily be led to do that when it comes to Guild Wars and you think about the crystals in the Guild Halls and the connections between crystals and magic and all these questions they've been uh, flirting with about how Joko became a lich. And, you know, I can see it. So anyway, here's the response. It's from Jessica, and she says... Breaking out the crystal in terms of setting up a formal get-together. Metaphorically, the linen tablecloths, the fine silver, the china, the crystal stemware, etc. The whole kit and caboodle. And then she says full stop. And I, you can almost sense the... Oh my god, I can't believe you didn't get... The, the rolling of the eyes there a little bit. To which uh, another community member, Diogo Silva, comes and says this. Quotes her. And says... As a, yet amateur, fantasy fiction writer myself, one thing I've noticed about the fantasy genre is that we writers have to be extra careful when adding metaphors to our work. Some of them can be too easily interpreted as literal. What can be seen as poetic imagery in normal fiction can be interpreted as world building in fantasy fiction. Full stop. Now, I've given them a little bit of a tone there. They might have been very nice and pleasant. This is a little bit of that internet know it allism I was talking about in the big video last week. Jessica responds by saying idioms are a standard part of English. And that's it. That's the AFC done. Okay, so we won't get anything else from the AFC. However,. Very shortly after this exchange was when Jessica went to Twitter and posted this tweet here, which I showed you on that previous video. The one where she says, as an amateur fantasy writer, I would like to tell you, a professional fantasy writer, dot, 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 and maybe listen to yourself and stop right there, my dude. Now, many of us interpreted on the day in the fallout of the big thing that this was in reference to Daror, but it actually wasn't. This was just before the Daror stuff came out, which obviously was a bombshell on its own. But here she was already lashing out, but it's someone completely different. This person even uh, messaged me on Reddit to clarify it very shortly after I covered this. And I wanted to set the record straight on that as well. Another weird thing that got through the cracks. Uh, and just to clarify here, Inks even said... Um, while it's odd they would classify themselves and you as such as possible, they still had valuable criticism. And Jessica said, nah, the advice was never use idioms or metaphors because people might take them literally. So, yeah, th this is bl her bluntly and directly lashing out at members of the Guild Wars community based on things she was doing on the clock all in that same time. And it all got swelled up together. And I feel like I, again, did really, really badly by messing that slight nuance up there. So there you go. You can see how tightly the AMA and the AFC all, all ingrained into that other stuff. And uh, where we got, how, how we got from A to B to C. And there you go. That's the AFC, guys. Uh, some pretty nice responses there. Again, really quite sure. I don't know how excited genuinely I am for the episode 4 AFC. I will, of course, cover it. But I hope that there's more community and developer interest in these. It, see, it strikes me, unless the devs remove a ton of threads. And maybe the point is that they have a ton of threads to remove because people are posting the wrong stuff. Uh, but unless the devs are removing a lot of posts, it doesn't seem that there's even many questions being asked to the devs. Are they doing the AFCs too early? Are they not different enough from the AMAs? Was it just this release? I'm not sure. Hopefully you found something good there, guys. And hopefully you've enjoyed me going through and reading all this stuff and giving you my take on all of it. I know it's been a lot of the same stuff for a while now. But I think we're pretty much caught up. So, uh, yeah. Cheers, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget, again, if you're still interested in more of my opinions about the story, many of you in the comments are asking, hey, when are you going to cover the story? I already have. We've got, like, 8 to 12 hours of pure story lore discussion playthrough stuff on Wooden Potatoes 2. Just go click over there. I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, and that, that's gone on this entire season. You guys may not have been looking for it, but it's there. Uh, and you get way more detail out of that than like a 40 minute sum up video I was doing dur during season 3. So cheers everybody, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you tomorrow.